dawn, a Tibetan trumpet signals the start of the day in the Himalayas. The silence of the monks at the Buddhist temples in northern India is broken by their prayers. We're going to tour the kingdoms of the Himalayas, an awe-inspiring environment inhabited by humble people who feel a constant need to communicate with the hereafter. To discover the cultural essence of the Tibetan people, we will enter the inaccessible valleys of Ladakh. Visit the cliffs of Gandaki in Nepal, where the Guru collect honey with their bare hands. Explore Tibet, where we will find temples in which the prayers are made of stone, and mountains covered with prayers that the wind carries to the afterlife. Seek out the cultures that settled here centuries ago, at the foot of the tallest mountains in the world, halfway between the past and the heavens. meters. After leaving behind even the rudest of roads, in a landscape unmarked by any trace of human beings, we find a camp of nomadic herdsmen. They are Kambas, a people of yak herders who wander the high plains in search of pasture land. Their lives center on their herds. The yaks provide them with sustenance, not just meat, but a whole series of foods made with the milk of the drill, the female yak. Their tents are also made with the skins of these animals. The ropes and braces that keep these light structures standing when the wind blows are made with the hair and tendons of yaks. Inside, the kambas burn yak dung to keep the tents agreeably warm. The tent is bare, without any decoration or any luxuries, but when we enter, we feel a sense of comfort that is difficult to explain. The kambas practice polyandry. All the brothers have children with the same woman and together they take care of all their offspring. In this way, the herds are kept in the family from generation to generation, without being divided up among different heirs. They break camp and settle elsewhere 10 to 12 times a year. They spend half their lives running away from the cold, and the other half looking for fresh pasture land at higher and higher altitudes. They pack up their scant possessions in just a few minutes. They tie the bundles on the backs of the strongest yaks and set off. This is a common sight in the kingdoms of the Himalayas.
But things change. The nomadic life is bound to disappear in Tibet for social and political reasons. In a few years, the caravans of nomads will vanish from the landscape. of the Himalayas. It covers a territory totaling 1,200,000 square kilometers. The mountains prevent the rains of the wet monsoon from the south from reaching the area, so its climate is dry and extremely cold. Very few people live here, and there are no highways. The only safe way to travel is to follow the Yak caravans which slowly advance along the mountain slopes at an altitude of more than 5,000 meters. The Himalayas cover parts of China, India, and Nepal. This vast mountain system includes eight of the world's 10 tallest peaks. The region is also the source of some of Asia's most important rivers, the Yellow River, the Yangtze, the Indus, and the sacred Ganges, whose waters irrigate an area inhabited by more than 400 million people. Each people in the Himalayas has a legend that explains how the mountains were formed. For scientists, they are the result of the collision of the Indian subcontinent with Southern Asia, which took place millions of years ago. For the average man, they are a never-ending series of valleys through the mountains, with a severe climate that might be described as perpetual winter. The first people to explore this region of the planet called it the Third Pole. It's always attracted travelers from all corners of the world. And not only those who are drawn by the challenge of climbing to the top of the world, but also those hunting for legends like Shangri-La or the Valley of Eternal Youth. Whatever the case, the Himalayas offer a series of spectacular landscapes and unique places where man has no choice but to bow before nature. Life in the Chinese region of Yushu unfolds at heights that are above the highest peaks in Europe. We are heading for the city of Jekundo. The landscape is peppered with religious objects that exalt nature. These colorful scarves are called katas. The faithful write their prayers on them and then tie them so that the wind will carry those prayers to the heavens. The buildings are crowned with so-called wind horses, long ropes with colored scarves. The white ones are offered up to ask for help to overcome an obstacle. There are also yellow ones for a long life, red ones for energy, and blue and green ones for activity. All nature is sacred here. The paths, hills, and places where a holy man was born, lived or died, are venerated. At the sources of the rivers, we can find carved stones engraved with prayers.
The trees are also sacred. They are considered the union of the sky that they touch with their branches and the earth that they sink their roots into. As the years go by, the longest live trees become pilgrimage sites. When we reach Jekundo, the capital of Yushu, after a route full of religious symbols, we understand why these lands are known as the Land of the Hundred Monasteries. The Yushu region lies in the Chinese province of Qinghai, on the border with Tibet. 90% of the population is Tibetan, but their daily lives weren't altered when the Chinese invaded in 1951. The city maintains the true Tibetan traditions. Way back in the 7th century, King Songsten Gampo and his wife passed through here on their way to Lhasa. And ever since then, the city has grown in importance and become a pilgrimage site. The sound of the prayer wheels and the droning of mantras fill the place. It's hard to remember that we are in 21st century China. Kundo was a forbidden city for travelers until the 1990s. Its inhabitants aren't accustomed to seeing foreigners, who they watch with the same curiosity as we watch them. In recent years, tourists have begun to arrive, coming to visit their monasteries and a uniquely original temple. This is the Gyanak Temple, the largest Mani temple in the world. A Mani is a stone with religious inscriptions. In Gyanak, there are millions. The number of stones grows every day. Some are only a few centimeters long, while others weigh more than 50 kilos. The temple covers a surface area of one square kilometer, and the piles of stones are more than a meter high. The sentence most often heard is the famous mantra, O Mani Padme Hum. Kathmandu, the capital of Nepal, is the destination that all mountain climbers dream of. The city is full of both Buddhist and Hindu temples. The most famous of all is the Temple of Bodhnath. The dome-shaped stupa that crowns the building ends in a square tower from which the eyes of Buddha look at the four cardinal points. This is a good place to observe the customs of the Nepalese people and an excellent starting point to explore the south face of the Himalayas. Anapurna, Everest, Gangapurna, Kangsgar Khan, eight of the ten tallest mountains on earth stand on Nepalese soil. Every year, the valleys on the southern slopes of the Himalayas are visited by the rains of the wet monsoon. The temperatures are warm and the vegetation abundant. There are also countless streams and rivers which encourage human settlements.
The fields of barley, rice, and corn dot the landscape. As we travel farther from the valley of Kathmandu, the population is more and more scattered. But unlike in Tibet, the presence of humans is apparent, above all in the depths of the valleys, where the wind-blown fields of crops imitate the sea. In one of these lost valleys, in the Gandaki region, at the foot of the Annapurna Ridge, we find the Guru. The Guru are hunter-gatherers. During the colonial period, many of the men enlisted in the famous Gurkha regiments. And when their stint in the service had concluded, they returned and bought their traditional lands. They became farmers and cattlemen, but the deforestation caused by creating the fields they farmed quickly depleted the soil. Now they make a modest living from the sale of their corn crops, but twice a year, in spring and fall, the Gurun get ready for the event that has made them famous throughout the world. The preparations take weeks. Everything has to be ready for the big day. Following the tradition, they kill and slaughter the best animals in their herds, and every last grain of corn must be duly ground. Two days a year, the Guru revive the spirits of their ancestors and ask for their protection during the honey harvest. The priest leads a ceremony during which they consult the god of the forest and the three spirits that live in the honey hill. The complex ritual blends elements of animism, Buddhism, and Hinduism. The honey gatherers have absolute trust in the protection of the spirits. That's the only way to explain how they gather enough courage to carry out their task. After analyzing the signs, they satisfy the will of the spirits by sacrificing the sheep. Only the chosen have the right to collect honey. It's a distinction passed down from father to son. When the sacrifice is accepted, the priest anoints the chosen with red tikka, the sacred rice, which distinguishes and protects the men who will conquer the bees. Once the ceremony ends, the eldest man gives the order to get started. The next day, at dawn, all the men in the town start the long journey to Shamsavir, the Cliff of the 300 Hives. The descent is slow. The humidity of the forest turns the ground into a slippery trap, making it very difficult to make progress. Finally, when they reach the top of the cliff, the group stops to finish their preparations. They make several torches from green branches, which give off a lot of smoke. The man chosen to go down after the honey ensures his safety with a crude harness and protects his face with mosquito netting, while the rest of the group hangs the ladder over the cliff. Almost 100 meters down, dozens of hives are waiting to be harvested. Hives of Apis laboriosa, 
the largest and most aggressive bees in Asia, and also the bees that make the highest quality honey. First, the gatherer holds the torches close to the honeycombs to drive off and confuse the bees. Enraged, the bees attack the gatherer and everyone at the top of the cliff. The only way to keep from getting stung is to stay calm or keep absolutely still. The second phase is the most delicate. It consists of removing the honeycombs. To do that, the gatherer uses two long sticks that he controls with his feet. Finally, after hundreds of stings, the gatherer places a basket lined with goatskin to catch every last drop of the sweetest food found in the valleys of Gandaki. The perpetual snow at the top of Mount Daulakili, over 8,100 meters high, lights up with the first rays of sunlight. Mustang, a valley in Nepal that was closed off to Westerners for centuries. Every morning, the sound of Tibetan trumpets wakes up the novices in the monasteries. Throughout the Himalayas, the lack of resources in the villages forces families to send their sons to the monasteries, where they are guaranteed an education and the means to live. After praying for a couple of hours, the novices meet in the refectory for breakfast. The diet in these humble religious centers is very frugal. Tibetan tea, a tea whipped with lard and sampa, roasted barley flour. The boys learn Buddhist philosophy and the Tibetan language. Unfortunately, these studies aren't very useful. One of the great checks on the development of these areas is the number of young men who dedicate their lives to religion. With this enormous human capital locked away behind four walls, it's hard for the people to make progress. The boys play in their free time, especially at Barchal, a Nepalese board game which requires ingenuity skill and concentration, and which some people considered as complex as chess. But when the monks aren't watching, the little novices spend their time on less intellectual pursuits. After all, they're only children. Obtaining footage of the Potala Palace, even with an amateur's camera, is no easy feat. The Chinese authorities put all kinds of barriers in the way of anyone who wants to film in Lhasa, the capital of the Kingdom of Tibet. They think that public opinion throughout the West shares the ideas of the Dalai Lama, and they're not very far off base. 
Lhasa has changed a lot since 1951, when China occupied Tibet. Now, six decades later, the controversy is still very much alive. But the scene has changed so much that one has to think that perhaps the ancient kingdom of the Lamas will never return. When the Chinese invaded, Tibet traded an oligarchic theocracy for a communist dictatorship. After the departure of the Dalai Lama, the country experienced a real cultural and social revolution. Over the years, the traits of the old regime have dissolved in a torrent of new elements that include new infrastructures and consumer products. Nevertheless, Tibet is not an independent country and its inhabitants are not free citizens. and it was moved here when the exile began. Namgyal maintains the teachings and practices of the four main traditions of Tibetan Buddhism. The main responsibility of its 175 monks is to carry out the ritual and spiritual tasks for the Dalai Lama and his government. For that reason, it is the preferred destination for all the Tibetan refugees who reach Damshala. Buddhism has countless branches, schools, and doctrines. All of them follow the teachings of Siddhartha Gautama, an Indian prince who lived over 2,500 years ago. Here in Namgyal, the essence of Tibetan Buddhism is preserved, the essence that spread from Lhasa throughout the north of India, Nepal, Bhutan, and the Mongol Empire. Namgyal has grown steadily since the exile began. Today, it is the repository of Tibet's cultural heritage. In the covered patio of the monastery, the prayers turn into a clamor. The novices are learning philosophy through debate and reasoned argument. The presence of the Dalai Lama has turned Dharamshala into a tourist destination of prime importance. Travelers discover a city with a Tibetan air in the middle of India. People from all over the world, of all races and all religions, mingle in its streets. Tibetans make up more than 40% of the population. Buddhism and Tibet's political message impregnate daily life. Hotels, restaurants, and antique shops are run by Tibetans. In less than two decades, Dharamshala has become Little Lhasa.
Near the palace of the Dalai Lama, we find the seat of the Tibetan government in exile, where it coordinates the refugee aid and fights for an end to the nightmare that has already lasted more than half a century. Those refugees who stand out for some sort of artistic talent are taken in here, in the Norbulinka Institute, created to preserve and disseminate the Tibetan refugees, learn the techniques employed for centuries by Tibetan carpenters, whose work can be seen in the altars and thrones of the most luxurious palaces in India and the Middle East. This sculpture studio is an artisan's workshop where images of Buddha are made. This is the most highly valued and profitable artistic expression. The students who complete their training in this specialty are the ones who have the best job prospects. When the masters finish their work, the figures are ready to adorn temples and monasteries throughout the world. Today, most of the images created at the Norbolinka Institute can be found in religious centers in the United States and Europe, where Buddhism is rapidly gaining followers. The homes have only one room. In the center stands the stove that is used to cook and heat the house. There is no furniture, only a few modest utensils and some straw mattresses to sleep on. The population is of Tibetan origin. They speak Ladakh, and today they are Indians, although over the course of history, they have changed nationalities on numerous occasions. Most Ladakhis make their living farming, the most common crop is barley. In some parts of the valleys, they plant fruit trees and corn. While recently, rice has been introduced, a crop that was considered a luxury product only a few years ago. Ladakh means land of passage. Historically, it has been a route linking China and Persia linking east and west. The pilgrims who passed through here on their way to sacred Mount Kailash founded a series of monasteries that stand out on the hills. Today, this landscape of mountains and monasteries is the valley's mark of identity. Small communities of monks have preserved Buddhist traditions here for 2,000 years. Inside, in the shadows, the music and prayer repeat themselves ceaselessly. It is the sound of mantras, of prayers to Buddha. Within their old walls, these monasteries guard true treasures. On these shelves, they keep prayer rolls written on rice paper. These rolls contain the mantras that they chant every day. Figures of Buddha are everywhere and are the most venerated religious objects. But it wasn't always like this. Buddha himself wouldn't allow his followers to create images of him. And so, during the first few centuries of Buddhism, artists represented Siddhartha Gautama with countless allegorical images.
represent the four cardinal points. The cupolas represent water. On top of them are placed a spiral, a half moon, and a sun, in honor of fire, air, and space. The faithful have gathered around one of these chortons to start out on a three-day pilgrimage to the city of Leh in commemoration of the death of a local holy man. Leh is the capital of the Valley of Ladakh, an old nine-story castle built on the side of the hill commands the city. It has been uninhabited since 1942, the year in which the valley was annexed to Kashmir by the Indians. The city has more than 25,000 inhabitants. In the past, its prosperity was based on trading in tea, salt, and tapestries. Today, it's a strategic point on the Indian map because of its proximity to the conflictive borders with China and Pakistan. The valley was opened up to tourists in 1974. Since then, such unheard of things as hotels and movie theaters have cropped up. Nevertheless, Lech preserves the air of a remote city, lost in time and space. reached the city after prostrating themselves hundreds of times. First they clap above their heads, then they touch their foreheads and hearts, and finally they lie on the ground with their arms spread wide. The monastery of Tixi is found 17 kilometers outside Leh. It is one of the most important and best preserved monasteries in the valley. It stands 12 stories high, is home to 10 temples, and was built to resemble the great Potala Palace in Lhasa. Inside, we can see one of the best collections of Buddhist art in northern India. One of the most valuable works is this impressive figure of Buddha. The frescoes date from the 16th and 17th centuries, and next to them, we find the shelves on which they keep the sacred mantras. The monastery of Lamayuru is where the yearly dance festival is held. For two days, the patio of dances, or Chamra, is the stage for a gigantic group exorcism. Every movement, every act interpreted by the dancers, is an action carried out by the gods to ward off evil spirits. It's a religious, social, and cultural event in which people from all over the valley and of all social classes take part. A group of local musicians entertains us during the wait with strident and repetitive music. They play for hours, showing great dedication to make up for their obvious lack of talent.
Little by little, the monastery fills with people. The square, the balconies, the rooftops, the windows, any place is a good place to watch the most important spiritual event of the year. When the monks and the police have everything under control, the first group takes the stage. It's said that this festival has been held here in Lama Yuru for more than 200 years. The trumpets announce the start of the ritual. The first group of masked performers immediately appears in the square, preceded by two monks who blow their trumpets. When the dancers take their places in the center of the Chamra, the eldest monk leads a prayer that is followed by all those attending. The dances portray the fear that Buddhists feel for demons and monsters, although some anthropologists interpret them as the victory over the ego the final aim of Buddhism. The essence of these rituals is to be found in the Bon, a set of shamanic beliefs that composed the dominant religion in the Himalayas before the arrival of Buddhism. Over time, the population embraced the new religion, but without abandoning the old beliefs, thus creating a religious amalgam that much of Tibetan popular culture rests on. dance group adds its own symbolic elements, but all the dancers bear a bowl or vessel. The monks use the receptacles to capture the forces of evil, which cause floods, earthquakes, fires, droughts, and starvation. Thanks to the monks' cordiality, we were able to enter the rooms in which they dress. Only the inhabitants of the monastery may come in here during the celebrations. For the Ladakis, what happens in these rooms is a mystery that they don't want to discover. The figures that come down the stairs are true spirits, real supernatural beings. Yet another year, the tradition has been fulfilled. The dancers have captured the demons that send misfortune down to the earth, preserving the essence of the Tibetan people in their refuge at the end of a lost valley in northern India. The landscapes of the kingdoms of the Himalayas make us feel insignificant. The snowy peaks, the infinite plains, the abrupt gorges. Everything seems ready for giant beings to come alive. Nevertheless, even in the highest mountains in the world, where no tree grows nor any animal lives, Man has left his mark and taken possession of the land.
For thousands of years, man has lived here, at the foot of the ceiling of the world, defying the altitude and the long winters, trusting that the sun will bring another dawn and a new day.